The title of my presentation today is Knowledge Power Land, a Critical Evaluation of the Land Governance Orthodoxy. In the 12 years since the global financial crisis, we have witnessed a marked shift from the highly polarized debate surrounding the global land grab to the emergence of land governance as a prominent object of international development discourse funding, multi-stakeholder collaboration, knowledge production, and donor pro programming. With significant buy-in from previously antagonistic actors, it is important to take stock of this shift and what it means. This paper draws on theoretical insights on the relationship between knowledge and power to critically evaluate the theory of change behind the emergent land governance orthodoxy through a look at the empirical evidence. Taking a look at the VG VGGTs or the voluntary guidelines on the governance of tenure and the land link on the World Bank website, we can see that a few key concepts stand out in our framing and ambitions in the land governance domain, from rights to tenure security to women's rights and empowerment. And while these wider ambitions stand as self-evident truths in terms of the things to which we all aspire, do their actual effects match the theories of change the development community operates under, or each of you operates under? Here, following Vassen, a theory of change may be defined as a structured set of assumptions regarding how an intervention works or is expected to work and how it influences or is expected to influence processes of change. I will do this by focusing on two themes that feature prominently in land governance of relevance to the commons, collective titling and women's land rights. I explore the theories of change behind each and contrast this with the evidence from the wider literature. The chapter in the book that I'm writing that is devoted to the topic of collective titling identifies three theories of change behind the growing support for collective title. The first body of thought seen most prominently in dialogues surrounding the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues is that collective title is crucial for Indigenous rights, identity, self-determination, and even survival as distinct peoples. A second body of thought emanating from the international environmental and climate change movement is its potential to reduce deforestation and related greenhouse gas emissions. And a final body of thought on the benefits of collective titling, advocated most clearly by the World Bank, is the view that collective titling provides, quote, an accountable and representative structure for local land administration, and quote, clarity on who to negotiate with on investments and compensation during the acquisition of customary land. It is evident here that there are some fundamentally distinct visions for collective titling and its role in rural futures. Alongside this recognition of collective rights is the advancement of mechanisms to facilitate interactions with the state, whether it be forms of group reg registration as legal per persons for purposes of registering land ownership, mechanisms for community consultation and consent in the context of laws, policies, or projects affecting customary lands, or means for indigenous peoples to represent their own collectivities and interests vis-a-vis -vis outsiders. As noted by Mar Marcus Colchester and Fergus McKay back in 2004, and I quote, recognition of collective rights, notably rights to common properties or territories, brings indigenous peoples customary institutions into direct relations with outside interests, end of quote. And in recent years, we have seen a proliferation of guidelines for respecting land rights that endorse land acquisitions, provided they follow certain procedures that lend them procedural legitimacy, such as free prior and informed consent. These guidelines and the visions underlying them are most aligned with the third set of ideas surrounding collective titling, which has gained prominence, where community consultations are coupled with collective rights recognition, not to safeguard indigenous identities and self-determination, or to mitigate climate risk, or even to safeguard those rights in the hands of indigenous peoples themselves or local communities, but to enable the alienation of communal lands. This vision stands in stark contrast with the vision most aligned with the indigenous rights movement, which tends to view the strength of recognition of indigenous territory in terms of the so-called three eyes, land rights that are inalienable, imprescriptible, and inembargable or immune from seizure and thus unmortgageable are understood to ensure, quote, that indigenous territories like the peoples that own them are perpetual in nature. This is a quote is from Roldan. And to minimize the risk that indigenous land will be incorporated into land markets. 
I now turn to two countries identified by legal scholar Liz Alden Wiley to be among those in which collective land rights are strongest and where the right to consultation is enshrined in the law, Mozambique and Peru. So what I'm about to show you should be something like best practice if the laws correspond with what happens on the ground. Mozambique has long been recognized as a country having one of the most progressive land laws in Africa, placing customary rights on par with other rights and recognizing these rights irrespective of their formalization. They've also recognized collective rights and provide options for formalizing them. They require community consultation for investment in communal lands, and they even have national level efforts to le level the playing field for communities through legal literacy and local organizational strengthening. Yet in practice, land use and benefit rights or duots are regularly issued to outside actors in areas where customary rights are recognized and practiced. As in this case, where over 22 entire villages are encompassed by a duot issued to a forestry company. And in practice, according to the director of the provincial cadastral services, land rights for communities has co have come to mean the absence of conflict rather than ongoing access for local land users. In essence, overlapping rights are allocated and corporations and communities are supposed to simply work it out. By this account, there is no overt protest. If there is no overt protest or conflict, rights are considered honored. And yet in this case, most people have simply voluntarily moved away, realizing there's no future for them in this area. According to the NGO ORAM, the growing insecurity faced by communities along Mozambique's growth corridors has led them to lose faith entirely in collective title and try their best to invest in a more secure individual title, even to tiny parcels that will enable them to meet the bare minimum of food security needs. Turning now to Peru, where as documented again by Wiley, important strides have been made in recognizing collective land rights. Peru is the first Latin American country to pass a generalized law requiring prior consultation for indigenous or native communities. Yet it is also where the insecurity of collective rights remains high, even within those communities whose collective rights have been formalized. This is due to multiple factors from the state's reluctance to recognize indigenous identities in the Andean and coastal regions, and thus the rights to consultation. Secondly, uh, to the fact that where indigenous identities are recognized, the titling of um, rights are uh, carried out in the form of titling of small communities rather than indigenous territories, thereby fostering political fragmentation of indigenous peoples. And thirdly, the fairly, failure to recognize rights to forest or subsurface resources on lands that are titled in, in the name of native communities and where communities um, face ongoing uh, regulation of the use of those resources. The small gains that have been made were also built on a long history of state-backed violence and indigenous mobilization to defend their lands and livelihoods. And the strengthening of indigenous institutions and sustained mobilization are seen as the only way to sustain even past gains. Moving on to women's land rights, the ideas that the international development community has seemingly bought into include first the idea that women's tenure security is under threat secondly that these threats are due to discriminatory laws and customs and to marital relations as opposed to commercial and political pressures on land and thirdly that security is best advanced by unambiguous individual and alienable rights backed by the state a deep reading of the published evidence, much of it ethnographic, reveals a number of counter truths to this dominant narrative. Firstly, that what we call custom is in fact practices emerging out of a long history of interaction with colonial and post-colonial regimes, and thus a product of interactions with the state. And secondly, the formalization itself creates opportunities for the, assertion, for the assertion of patriarchal control, as seen in titling to men in matrilineal areas where inheritance passes through the women's line, in efforts by state ag agents to curtail women's rights under gender-blind titling, in the Western and gender uh, bias, in the uh, form of failure of reforms to recognize the rights of women and children in informal or polygamous unions, among many other examples. The evidence also reveals that many so-called threats to women's tenure security are more about the limited understandings of outsiders than the actual dynamics at play. 
whether in the case of descent-based land holdings, in which the so-called secondary status of wives reflects a logic of retaining land in the lineage, which one could argue lends security to all lineage members, male and female alike, and all generations, I would add. Secondly, systems of matrilineal, matrilocal kinship in which women's rights are stronger than men's and where co-titling in the name of the man and the woman would erode those rights. And lastly, the contradictions between the perceived and actual roles and status of so-called male caretakers, such as the Muni Mbumba as documented by Pauline Peters in the Shire Highlands of Malawi, who are often assumed to be primary rights holders who, are, who oppress their female kin, but who in fact access land through their wives or sisters and are considered borrowers with weaker rights than them. There are also problems with the assumption, assumptions and methodologies of researchers themselves who produce notions of a homogenous category of women rather than a differentiated understanding of the unique positionality of daughters and sisters relative to wives and widows, as long pointed out by Pauline Peters and others, and with their exclusive look at customary rights rather than duties. In descent-based landholding systems in Africa, if we were to, to ask men and women if others have duties to care for women, rather than if women have rights, how different might our findings be? So I must ask, are we really doing what we think we are? And if not fully, then what else might we be doing? A book by feminist scholar Abu Lugod re reveals that growing concern by Western feminists of the use of the veil as a form of women's oppression in mu Muslim societies, not only failed to reflect how differently positioned Muslim women think of the veil, but aligned with the rise of US geopolitical interests in Afghanistan and helped to justify US military interventions abroad. Might something similar be going on in our growing concern for women's land rights? That embedded in emancipatory discourse are efforts to advance Western interests more so than the interests of the presumed beneficiaries themselves. I want to suggest, and I, and I am by no means the first to do so, that commodification of customary land might be a more accurate description of what is actually being done in the name of land governance than safeguarding rights or enhancing tenure security. And that this commodification benefits those with an interest in acquiring customary land, such as foreign investors and domestic elites, more than customary rights holders themselves. When writing an unrelated paper, I stumbled across an article by Noel Castree on the key elements of commodification. And I was struck by how many elements resonate with land governance discourse and practice. I want to unpack a few just to give you a flavor. The first fe feature of commodification is individuation, defined by Castree as the representational and physical act of separating a specific thing or entity from its supporting context, e.g. putting legal and material boundaries around phenomena so that they can be bought, sold, and used by equally bounded individuals, groups, or institutions." End of quote. If we look across the different land governance instruments, this can be seen in many ways. ways. First, in land demarcation and titling, which places physical and legal boundaries around discrete units of property. Secondly, in the registration of rights holders, which places legal boundaries around individuals or groups holding rights. And thirdly, the emphasis on women's independent property rights uh, in prominent discourses, most notably by the World Bank and by FAO. The second feature of commodification is privatization, the assignation of legal title to a named individual, group, or institution. This may be seen in the, the discursive and programmatic emphasis on titling, as the way in which rights are to be secured, and also in emphasis within discourse on the unambiguous specification of rights and rights holders or legal certainty, such as the World Bank's emphasis on, quote, clearly defined rights to land and associated natural resources, end of quote. A third dimension of commodification is alienability or the capacity of a given commodity to be physically and morally separated from its sellers. This is observable in legal provisions enabling collectively held land, collectively held and titled land to be alienated. Secondly, in voluntary standards equating land rights with a process of negotiating its alienation through things like community consultation. 
third, in evidence of actual land loss with titling and collateralization, and fourth, the World Bank's emphasis on land markets or, quote, voluntary and welfare enhancing land transfers, end of quote. And the last two elements of commodification are valuation and abstraction, which I don't have time to go into today. So if you buy into the arguments that commodification is in fact one of the core aims of land governance, it is important to ask whose interest exactly the, the commodification of land serves. Here, insights from history may be most informative. In his long-term analysis of Native American land rights in the United States, historian Stuart Banner finds legal in discursive moves to recognize Native American land rights actually corresponded with those moments in time when outside interest in land was most intense and when those very same rights were most rapidly extinguished. So lots of talk about recognition of rights and legal moves to recognize those rights actually correspond with land loss. Thus, there's a clear linkage between the codification of rights and the legal certainty that this provides and, uh, and the ambiguities and flexibilities that it erases on the one hand, and land transfers out of the customary domain on the other. I wanna close by acknowledging the many collaborators and funding sources that have contributed in important ways to my, to my thinking, and to invite questions for those who might be viewing this from afar. Thank you. <laughs>